I want to say thank you, Paula and Michael, and you will hear a lot from them today. Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Miguel de Allende. I'm Robin Loving, and I'm part of our Sunday service team, and I'll be your service leader today. We welcome you, whoever you are, and Zoomers, wherever you are. Thank you for being with us. We don't know what your spiritual path is. It doesn't matter what race you are, the sexual orientation, gender identity, you are welcome here, and we hope that you've brought your whole selves. Um, we are so grateful to live in a community that has such a rich cultural heritage. I know that that's part of why I'm here and so many that I'm seeing in the audience here today. We're on the ancestral lands of the Chichimeca, the Otomi, and the Nahua, and a lot of us have he that heritage within us. Welcome to everybody, and please observe the culture around you. So we, I, I haven't got a list of visitors here today. Are there any visitors here today? Oh, please stand, sir, and tell me your name and where you're from so we can see you at coffee hour. I'm Gary Tanner. Uh, I'm from San Miguel. Fantastic, Gary. Thank you so much. Gary Tanner from San Miguel. You'll meet him at coffee hour. Are there any other guests here with us today? Okay. Well, we know that even if you don't declare, we will see you at coffee hour because you want Mama Nora and, and Don's cookies. They're the cookie couple. And even if you don't drink coffee like I don't, you're going to want to scarf up those cookies. And we will see you then and welcome you. So, Zoomers, I want you right now, please, to name yourself and your place in the chat box so that we can welcome you after the service. There will be questions that are posed based on our pro presentation today, and so lots of good conversation. I hope you have your cup of coffee or whatever this morning. You know, the 1970s were all about, remember, flower power. And as it turns out, there was a lot of scientific basis for that. Flowers increase our, our creativity, our innovation, our productivity. They have a positive effect on our moods and our emotions. They create emotional connections. They boost our sense of comfort. They increase our energy and they even improve our memory. So it's with these things in mind that we thank our dear friend Ellie, who isn't feeling well, but nevertheless brought these gorgeous flowers with a heart in the middle of them for hospice today and we thank her for bringing them. We know that our great uh, care team will take them to somebody who needs either memory improvement or mood improvement or something today, and so they will be gifted again later after the service. 
We record our services so that you can see them again and refer them to others. We know that a lot of people stayed home today for Zoom. They were expecting this to remind them of something and they wanted their Kleenex close. Um, so if you know somebody who wanted to hear this today and uh, is really interested in following it, we'll be right on the internet with our YouTube channel. Just check into UUFSMA.org whenever you're ready and we will uh, be there for you. While there, you can check out all the other activities we have going on during the week and you can see about membership if that's of interest to you. So as Kathy lights our candle to, uh, to light our chalice today, I want to share a quote with you from the first modern hospice founder, Dame Cicely Saunders, who said, you matter because you're you. You matter till the end of your life and beyond. We will do all we can, not only to help you die, but to help you live in the meantime. So thank you, Kathy, for lighting, and please stand as you're willing and able to join our voices in song for hymn 311, 311, Let It Be a Dance, and remain standing for our covenant. I'll remind you that again, but there will be words on your screen. Thank you. Thank you all you good singers out there. Please stay, remain standing as we recite our covenant, first in English and then in Spanish, thanks to Dr. Lulu Tejeda, who's the executive director and medical director of hospice. We respect the interdependent web of life and work for a just and peaceful world. We encourage the search for truth and meaning, strive for compassion in our relationships, and seek values that will benefit our lives and the lives of others. 
Respetamos todos los estilos de vida dentro de su red interdependiente y trabajamos por un mundo justo y pacífico. Alentamos la búsqueda de la verdad y la comprensión total. Nos esforzamos por mantener compasión en nuestras relaciones y buscamos valores que beneficien nuestras vidas y las vidas de los demás. Este es nuestro convenio. And now, please take a breath for a very sacred time in our service. As a caring community, every week we name those in our hearts and minds. And for each joy and concern, we light a candle indicating that that person or thought is carried by everyone here today. To share, the week before, you may email our Reverend Tom Rossiello and get on the list, or you can write a card the morning of service, or if you're on Zoom, you can type your joy or concern into the chat. Our first candle is one of great joy for Jürgen Ahlers, who had excellent hip replacement surgery on Tuesday in Houston. He is sincerely grateful for the many good wishes he's received from folks from this beloved community, and he plans to fly home to SMA this coming Thursday. And we have a candle of support for Linda Soren, who is home from the hospital, but with nursing care, as she continues to recover from a very bad fall. And we have a candle of concern from this morning, concern about the sudden deaths of young, healthy people, which are up 40% for the last two years in the US. We have, a, we have a candle of joy from Diana Weiner, both for the rain that we are finally getting and for her long-awaited travel to see family and friends. And we also have from Gary Turner a candle, and his joy is that I am returning to church and I saw him here, <laughs> welcome. We have a candle of healing for Shoshana Levinson in Connecticut, who continues courageously with the next round of chemo and has the support of her husband, Chris. And we have a candle of great love for Joan Wolf, who is doing well in treatment peacefully staying in a Zen Buddhist temple residence. And one week ago she wrote, with two good results, I am planning to return to Mexico in November, a month after my last infusion in October. And we have one more candle for all those in treatment or assessment for serious illness which hasn't been shared specifically with us today. And let me check the chat for any others. We have I believe uh, from Kirsten, rest in peace, Jimmy Buffett, and thank you all for caring about natural, indigenous, sentient sacreds. 
dying with dignity and passing on with peace. And now thinking of the larger community, once again, we light our blue and yellow candle of compassion for all those suffering from the war in Ukraine, civilian and military. And lastly, a candle of strength and resilience to remain vigilant for any way we have power to mitigate the ravaging effects of extreme climate events around the world. We hold all of this in great, the great care that we have for one another and our sisters and brothers on the planet. And One year ago, I was about to die, and I, and I hit, and I'm here now. Elisa. Elisa, who asks us to light a candle of joy, I think, for her and her son, because one year ago, she was near death, and now here she is, and in person. Thank you. And during the upcoming musical meditation, you may come forward in silence to light a candle for any joy and concern that you're holding in your heart today. And we can blow this out. And now I want to welcome Michael Moore, who will come to the podium and say a few words about the music we're about to hear. I thought it very appropriate to actually read the words to this poem by Joseph uh, von Eichendorf. And um, it was, it's a very important piece of, of music. It was the last piece that Richard Strauss actually wrote in 1948. He lived halfway through the 20th century. People think of him as a romantic composer, and of course he was, but he lived until 1949. And all he did was arrange one other piece that he'd written as a young man uh, after he wrote this, this piece. This is actually four last songs, and this is the last of the four last songs. Imoventhrot, which means at sunset. Through, and I hope I don't break down when I read it, <laughs> but through sorrow and joy, we have gone hand in hand. We are both at rest from our wandering, now above the quiet land. Around us, the valleys bow, the air already darkens. Only two larks soar amusingly into the haze, and you'll hear the larks in the piano. Come close and let them flutter. Soon it will be time to sleep so that we don't get lost in this solitude. O oh, vast, tranquil peace, so deep in the afterglow, how weary are we of wandering? Is this perhaps death?
Thank you again, Paula and Michael, the dynamic duo. Okay. You know, uh, Michael said, I hope I don't break down while I read this thing. I practiced this a dozen times this morning until I could take the Kleenex away. Because these moments are tender, tender moments, and they're personal moments. And we thank you for sharing your hearts with us here today. In the days before hospice, my mother, who had had a number of dramatic surgeries and had never, ever, ever said a thing about pain, uh, all of a sudden was in the process of passing. And I went to her and I put my hand gently, this gently, on her shoulder. And she said, Robin Ann, quit beating me. I went out to her medical team and I said, what can you do for her? She's suffering. And they said, we could give her some more medication, but it might not prolong her life. And I said, please do what you can. We all know where she is in the process. And thank goodness, she passed peacefully later that day. Later on, my sister was in the same position, and I didn't have to make that request because hospice was already there. Before hospice, after hospice, a whole lot of different perspective. And so, it's with that in mind that I share that we have a fabulous hospice here, and you're going to hear about the heart of hospice here today. Uh, our friend Lee Carter, who's here, founded hospice, and he's got other founders here with him, and he's got board members with him, he's got staff with him, and one of them, Brian Voris, is gonna come up and share with us a little bit today. Uh, Brian is going to be able to share with us very, very carefully and very uh, caringly about what hospice is here, its range, and lots of other really important aspects. So I want to invite Brian to share with us now. Good morning. I'm Brian Voris. I'm a board member of the local Mitigari Hospice Organization here. And I'm here today to talk about end of life care. Have you ever really sat down and considered how you will be treated at end of life? And, you know, who's going to take care of you? You know, I'm, I'm of the age, as many people here might be, where these are relevant questions today. And 
Since hospice first was created uh, by Ms. Saunders in the United States, it's actually more of a concept than a place. We want to uh, ensure that people have an opportunity to live the rest of their lives fully and compassionately and be treated in, with dignity and humanity at the end of their times. Uh, I'd like to take one second just to talk about the difference between palliative care and hospice. Now the philosophies are very similar. They're both about comfort care. And so the, the difference is that when you're in palliative care, you're still concerned with curative options. And in hospice care, you've decided it's not worth exploring or you don't want the pain or discomfort of any more tests or procedures or anything. And so that's the basis difference between the two. In Mexico, there's actually a law that allows everybody the opportunity or the right for palliative care. But the reality is, is palliative care here is only available at the specialty hospitals in most of the major uh, metropolitan areas. So the vast majority of regular Mexicans don't have access to palliative care. And, and I understand because of that, it, it's uh, difficult endings for many of these people out in the countryside. The, um, benefits of hospice care and why hospice care is important is that it gives people an opportunity to have their symptoms and their pain controlled so that they're available to be with their family and friends at the end of their time. Uh, hospice also supports emotional, psychological, uh, bereavement uh, services, and we have counselors available in all these areas. It's part of a hospice team approach that we make. And I'll talk about the actual hospice team we have in place here at Mitigari a little later on. But it's all a coordinated care system where the actual patients is treated, care is treated on what their wishes and desires are at the end of their life. Hospice has been around in the United States for a long time and because of that, most of the statistical information about it comes from the U.S. Uh, there's hospice also in Canada. And the, the primary difference between Mexico and the U.S. and Canada is that in Canada it's supported by the National Health Service and in the U.S. It's, uh, you're eligible through Medicare benefits to pay for your hospice coverage. In Mexico, there's no government support for hospice treatment. And while we have 5,000 hospices plus in the U.S. and I think a little over 700 in Canada, there's only one hospice in all of Mexico. And that's Mitigari here in San Miguel. So most people, given the choice, would prefer to die at home. So in the United States, I think it's about based on the hospice, National Hospice Organization, about 81% of people prefer to die at home. In the U.S., 2.5 million people die every year, and only about 25% of those people actually end up dying at home. But also in the U.S., about a million and a quarter of those people are enrolled in hospice. And of that group, 75% of those people get their desire and end up being able to die at home. And here in San Miguel, you know, since we, in the past we haven't had a facility or here or anything, all our hospice is outreach. So all the services are, are uh, applied in the person's home. And the advantage of that is obviously, you know, you're in a, a familiar environment, uh, your family and friends are around, you have pets. It, it's just a much more comfortable way to uh, pass a very trying time in everybody's life. We have a vision at our hospice group here that we want to develop a hospice program that's culturally appropriate for the entire community here in Mexico. And we want to deliver an international standard of care for palliative care type process that can be integrated into the local systems. Because we have a, in San Miguel, we have a system of 
communities, we have a system of like general public hospitals, and then we have a number of private hospitals. So we have to integrate our program so that it's applicable to all these various sources. We also have an objective to make sure the end of life quality of care is available with high quality and it was provided with humanism. So that everybody is treated as an individual. Every plan is tailored to the individual needs. So those are some big goals. And we want to try to fulfill that primarily through outreach and education programs and opportunities like this to come and talk to people about hospice and what we're doing and what services are going to be available to the community here. In 2019, we held the first international hospice conference in Latin America. It was held here in San Miguel. We had around 500 attendees to the conference. So there was a huge demand for information and knowledge about hospice in Latin America. We had speakers that came in from as far as uh, Japan and Spain. So it was a real international event. We also had symposiums and lectures and classes for doctors, for nurses, for uh, home health care workers. It, it was really a fantastic uh, opportunity for us and one that has allowed us to look at having further conferences in the future. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic has cut our plans on that, but we plan to resume these as early as next year. We have one ongoing training program right now that's funded by Carlos Slim, the Carlos Slim Foundation. <clears throat> it's to train uh, home health care workers. And this is a program that we've been involved in for several years, and we're optimistic that this program will get renewed and that we'll be able to continue to supply home health care workers for the community. A community like San Miguel, which has a preponderance of older people, has a big need for home health care workers, and we're trying to meet that. We also want to talk about um, sponsoring more medical related symposiums because we'd like to get more people certified in uh, Mexico, they call that valor calcular, which means you're certified and our aim is to get more people certified in the palliative care area so that we have more people to work with here and there's more people available for the various hospitals. You know, one of the reasons I'm excited about coming here and talking to you today is we have some really big news. For the last you know, year, we've been petitioning the city to allow us to supply us with some land where we could actually build a hospice facility here in San Miguel. And it's been a long process, but at six months ago, the city said that they were interested in joining with us in this effort. And they've um, created for us a comodato, which is it's kind of like a land grant or a long-term lease on property. And the, the Biblioteca here has the same kind of uh, uh, grant. And so what it allows us to do it is to have a property where we can actually construct our hospice facility. Um, the property they're giving us to use is just up the hill here on uh, Cuesta de San Jose. If you're familiar with the where the entrance is to the botanical gardens, on the other side of the road there's about a 90 meter lot that's about no, 17 or 18 meters wide. And this is the property they've identified for our facility. So we're, we actually have uh, acquired an architect. We've developed a plan. Uh, and through some work of our president, Les Matthews, we've received a quarter million dollar US grant to initiate the construction. We're going to do this project in two phases. The first phase is going to be the actual hospice facility. We're going to have three inpatient rooms that are available for people. We're going to have a patient assessment and intake facility. 
Uh, you'll have administrative offices. Uh, we'll have an office for our medical director, Dr. Tejeda. We'll have volunteer offices, kitchens, nurses station. It's going to be a real ongoing entity. And we'll be here, you know, the, probably at least the grant, well, the first grant before we renew it will probably be 30 to 50 years long. Certainly longer than I'm here. So it's going to be an opportunity for people to get involved in hospice. You know, a lot of volunteer opportunities are going to be available. And we're planning on starting the construction hopefully this fall. Uh, the second phase is going to be an educational facility where we can do most of this training. Uh, we're also going to have like uh, a bodega to store all our medical equipment. We're going to have uh, other administrative offices, uh, kitchens, and all, all the other things that make our, you know, they're going to be right next to each other, but they won't be connected per se. So that's really an exciting thing. So not only was this the first hospice in Latin America, we're going to be the first hospice house in Latin America. So what I, why I'm excited about it, because in the community that we have here, there's a lot of older single people that you know, maybe their spouse has passed on, or maybe they uh, don't have any family members here. And, and these people need a place to go at the end of their life, and we're going to have a facility to do that. There's all, outside the, this is going to be at the east end of our facility. There's also a green area out there, and we've even designated another section out there where we could build three more facing patient rooms. So we'd have a total of six inpatient rooms. And I think this kind of planning makes sense for us because San Miguel, let's face it, it's getting more popular all the time. And, and still we seem to attract a lot more older people than younger people. So we'll be available for that. The second thing I want to talk about, and this is really great news for the American expat community, is that, again, Les, <laughs> Les Matthews, our president, has negotiated a program with a group called Westlake Medical Group. And they're a hospice administrating facilitator. And what, by working with them, we're going to have U.S. citizens that are living in Mexico available for Medicare uh, reimbursement, not only for people that are staying in our hospice facility, but they have a network of 10 regional hospitals, of which Mac Hospital is one of them, where you can actually, if you're, if you're admitted through their emergency room, you can have your Medicare benefits cover all your hospital costs while you're there. You have to be eligible for Medicare and be enrolled in the Medicare Advantage program to take advantage of this. Um, afterwards, we're going to have a little session over here. We have a table set up, and we'll have more specific information about how you can get information and get your question answered about this uh, Medicare uh, Advantage project. We'll also have handouts over there, too. Now I'd like to talk just a minute about, since we're going to have this new facility, we're going to have a team that's going to be available. Our medical director, Dr. Tejeda, is really the heart of the hospice team here. I'd like to take just a second to kind of tell you her story. Uh, when she first got involved in the medical profession, she became a nurse. And then she thought, hey, I can do more. So then she went to medical school, and she graduated and became a doctor. And then she became an oncologist and is affiliated with the National Cancer Institute in Mexico City. And then she became a palliative care doctor. And she was even drafted by the uh, state of Guanajuato to be one of the directors of the COVID response here in Guanajuato. And during all this, she even had time to get a master's in public health management. So she's not only the heart of our thing, she's kind of my hero. She, <laughs> she really has uh, meant a lot for us to have such an outstanding person at the start of our team. She is surrounded by kind of a circle of other medical professional and volunteers 
This includes uh, visiting nurses, uh, doctors to help write treatment plans, uh, tanatologists, uh, people for bereavement support, uh, home health care workers, uh, spiritual people to supply spiritual guidance depending on what the person's uh, interest and requests are. And we even have uh, social workers that can help you with like end of life planning. Because, and I'll talk a moment later about end of life planning and what people can do. It's really important that people sit down and, you know, plan out how they, how they want to be treated and how to get their affairs in order. It makes it so much easier for the survivors. She also has access to a whole plethora of referrals for people that aren't within our care unit but might be needed by our patients. Uh, you know, like dietitians or physical therapists or people of this, you know, other areas. When everybody gets to their end of life care decision making, <clears throat> really, it, like in most places, you have two choices. You can go in the hospital or you could uh, go for hospice care. Um, probably, I mean, in hospital care can be great. I'm not here to down talk the hospitals. But the focus of most hospitals is to make the patient well enough so they can discharge them. And in many cases, they're sent home to some challenging conditions. Um, they're also, especially in the States, but even in here at the private hospitals, you know, choosing to stay in the hospital is also very expensive. You can incur a lot of debt. According to the National Labor and Statistics, in the US, a person's lifetime average medical expense is close to $400,000. That's a lot of money. Half of that is spent when people enter their elderly ages, 65 or 70, depending on you know, how that's figured out. And a quarter of it, or about $100,000, is spent in their last year of life. And even though it's a very practical way to look at it, this is why it's supported by the Public Health Service in Canada and by Medicare in the United States, because hospice, not only is it the kinder, gentler approach to light, end of life, it's also much less expensive than staying in the hospital and having all these tests and treatment when really the prognosis doesn't warrant it. Where hospice care, you're treated a majority of hospice care occurs in the patient's home or what they call their home. It, it could be a retirement facility or something like that also. And as we talked a minute ago, it's a comprehensive care you, that's based on the individual's patient's needs and wishes. We have access to uh, controlled medicines. And so one of the main elements of making someone more comfortable in this period of life is the fact that, you know, if you can control pain and control symptoms, people are available to enjoy more of their time at the end of life. Even in hospitals, because of some of the rules for controlled substances, it's difficult to get their pain medication in a schedule that's accommodating your pain needs. We've uh, developed a sliding scale for hospice patients here within our Mitigari group. And it's really based, uh, we have a committee and they evaluate the families and the patients and it's based on their ability to pay. You can, some families pay as little as 500 pesos a month and it goes up based upon your ability to pay, but even at the highest level, it doesn't cover all the expenses. We rely on volunteers and donations to cover those other costs. So, and also nobody has ever denied coverage for hospice because they can't pay. We have at our board meetings many times, the doctors will come up and talk about a specific case. The person doesn't really have any resources. And I've never, we always say yes. That's the great thing about this group is it's really concerned with the well-being of the people that we care for. I would like to take a second also because of the elements that hospice care brings to everybody 
you're in your home, you're surrounded by your loved ones, uh, your uh, spiritual and emotional needs are being met. Uh, you can have counseling, uh, bereavement counseling for the individual, also for the family. And that counseling goes on even after the person passes to the family. Because of these things, uh, I was surprised, uh, I was not surprised when I saw a study by the Hospice Council that said that people that go into hospice and are treated at their home <clears throat> live actually about a month longer than similar patients in the hospital setting. So there are some other tangible advantages to be involved in the hospice there, facilities. Um, we offer a lot of medical equipment where we have uh, beds, wheelchairs, shower chairs, oxygen concentrators, and, and our equipment list is even expanding. You know, originally, I think a lot of people thought that hospice was just about cancer patients. And even today, um, I think 38% of all hospice patients are cancer patients. But we're seeing that as people become more familiar with hospice and our ability to help, that a whole group of other people are coming into it. The second most common thing are like uh, congenital heart disease or heart issues. Uh, but now we're seeing more people with kidney issues, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, ALS. And so it's, it's really gratifying for us that all these people are trying to take advantage of what hospice brings to the market here. Um, it was very nice that when they opened the program, they talked about Cicely Sounders because she's kind of the godmother of all hospices. And she's really responsible for moving the palliative care movement forward and combining it with the fact that all people, all dying people need dignity, compassion, and respect. And that's the overlying philosophy which embodies our hospice group here. Primarily, hospice care is about providing compassionate and basically compassionate care. You know, we, we want to make sure everybody's treated as an individual and that they're treated according to their own wishes and desires. The next question that I ask myself, you know, when I ask, if I started this by asking myself, have you thought about how you will be taken care of? You know, will your wishes be granted? We're big proponents of <clears throat> end of life planning at hospice, not only on the medical side, but of getting your regular legal affairs in order. And coincidentally, um, here in San Miguel, I know it's something that the local lawyers, the abogados, put together in September. They offer 50% off on all will and estate planning services. And so it's a great time to sit down and think about how you might want to structure, you know, your affairs. And it makes it so much easier on your surviving people. So I encourage people to take a look at that. Um, you also, within a will, uh, you can put, uh, you know, medical issues you can deal with. If I'm incapacitated, I want a DNR, do not resuscitate, uh, other specific health care requests. And so I think that it's uh, important that we all look at those elements. Now, you, as far as contacting hospice, we have our basic information line. We also have a medical line. And we have our website at www.mitigari.org. And a lot of this information that we're talking about here today and further information is available on these sites. I would like to take a second here, when we, since we're talking about end of life planning and what we all can do, I want to leave you with some information because we're, we have alliances and resources with a lot of other organizations, uh, including the National Cancer, uh, group, Foundation for Hospice Care, and one of my favorites is an organization that does this brochure called Five Wishes. 
And I have filled this out and I recommend it to anybody who's dealing with end of life planning. If we have some of these at hospice, you can also get them online, but it addresses issues like, who do I want to make my healthcare decisions if I'm incapacitated? Uh, what kind of medical treatment do I want or don't want? How, how, how comfortable do I want to be kept? How do I want people to treat me during this period of life? And finally, what do, what do I want my loved ones to know? And it's all in a very easy form. You fill out like a form. But it brings a lot of questions into mind of things that I hadn't even thought about with my end of life planning. And so I made a copy of this. My wife has a copy and our local lawyer has a copy. So I want to make sure that my wishes are observed. And I think anybody here who's serious about doing end of life planning, they can do that. So what you might ask also is how can I make sure that these types of services are available not only to me, to the community in whole. And obviously, we're, we're an organization, we're an NGO. Uh, we spend a lot of money uh, training people, we spend a lot of money with our, our staff, we spend a lot of money helping patients. You know, we, we need support within the community. So if you, if you ever consider as an organization supporting us, we'd be very grateful and uh, we're going to be available over here at the coffee section, so if you have any specific questions, you can talk to me or Dr. Tejeda, or we have other volunteers here and also Les Matthews, who are our president. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you today, and I really very much enjoyed the service. I thought it was very thoughtful, so thank you. Of course, I want to thank Brian. He brought a huge team of people here with him today. Uh, they'll all be over here, including Carla Cadena, who's the administrator of Mitigari Hospice, and she was one of our Hovenus Adelante students. So we've been supporting Hovenus for a long time, and she's a product of that labor. Uh, Rocio Arredondo will be there, Marta Hamil. Uh, let's see who else, Les Matthews, he mentioned, etc. So these folks are extremely, extremely well qualified. I'm not going to go into all of that for you. But I am going to go into our time for a Blue Plate Special. A Blue Plate Special is done four times a year with our congregation. It's when we dedicate our pesos to a very special cause. As you know, we usually pass the basket and about half of that goes to us, and about half of that goes to the community, and that's that. But four times a year, our social action committee says, you know what, we don't have a grant, an ongoing grant to somebody like Mitigari Hospice, but we think they're so important, we'd like for you to pass the hat just for them. And we call those blue plate specials. So today, you'll hear more at the table about the options that we each have. Thank God, we've got hospice here. We, you know, as human beings, uh, demand and deserve the principles that we have here at UU, the principles of dignity, compassion, encouragement, and respect, and they're all about that. So I want you to think about, as a human being, as a patient, do you want the family support and the, and the medical support that you will need at end of life? And as the baskets is passed today, I'd love for you to dig deeply because every peso will go to the fantastic hospice here in San Miguel. The offering will now be collected and very gratefully received. Thank you.
Thank you again, Paula and Michael. And uh, we're going to raise our voices in song, but first, this just in. We failed to communicate earlier that Margot's President's Hour, ex-President's Hour tomorrow on Zoom at 10 o'clock will introduce some of our leaders. You know, we give our, our uh, Sunday services team a lot of credit for all that goes on here, but our leaders make that happen too, and we've got a lot of new ones. So we wanna make sure before we end the service today that you're aware of that. And now let's join our voices in song for hymn number 100, I've Got Peace Like a River. Stand as you're willing and able and see the lyrics here on your screen. Which verses? Oh, which verses? Verses one, two, three, four, and six. One. be seated if you'd like. As we contemplate the topic of today's service, let us consider this poem attributed to a loved one who has transitioned into the next stage of existence, the idea of which is to embrace love, not loss. When tomorrow starts without me and I'm not here to see, if the sun should rise and find your eyes filled with tears for me, I wish so much you wouldn't cry today as you did yesterday while thinking of the many things we didn't get to say. I know how much you love me, as much as I love you. And each time you think of me, I know I'll miss you too. When tomorrow starts without me, don't think we're far apart. For every time you think of me, I'll be right there in your heart. Thank you. <laughs> 